And with that, we do welcome you inside this week opening edition of Big Ten Today, presented by Gatorade. I'm your host, Rick Pizzo. Happy to report I will have company soon. Paul Capinigri is here. Cappy and I spent the previous week in St. Paul with Michigan at the Frozen Four. Comes up short in the national semifinals. We'll look back a bit, but also look ahead to what's on tap for next season. And Trent Meacham is here, too. Old man Meacham probably getting ready with a pre-show nap. In the green room, we'll talk transfers, NBA draft decisions, and more. All that coming up in a little bit. But we begin with the WNBA draft, which is our show's big story. Caitlin Clark, without question, will be the number one overall pick selected by the Indiana Fever. But you look at some of the mock drafts, a half dozen or more former Big Ten players set to move on to the next level and be WNBA professionals. The draft gets underway Monday night right around 7.30 Eastern time. And for much more on Monday night's WNBA draft, welcome in Megan McEwen. Megan, listen, Caitlin Clark is going to go first to the Indiana Fever. We know that's a fact. What we don't know is what the pro game will look like for someone who dominated at the college level. What will be her biggest challenge against other elite pros? The biggest challenge Caitlin Clark's going to have at the next level is she is about to face some of the most elite defenses that she is ever going to see. Once you get to the WNBA, you have to step it up about 15 notches when it comes to the defensive side of the ball. And when you look at some of the on-ball defenders in the WNBA, I think of like a Natasha Cloud. Certain players that are so committed and disruptive defensively, it's going to be completely different. The ball screen coverages defensively are different. There's going to be a lot smarter players guarding her. So she's going to have to figure out ways to still score and counteract not just the primary defender, but the secondary defender. Caitlin Clark is one of the smartest basketball players that we've seen so far at the college level. So I have no worries in my mind that she won't be able to make those adjustments, but it's going to be an adjustment regardless. The level of physicality is higher. The pace is faster. You're playing with pros. And so she's going to have a unique challenge on her hands, but nothing that she's not capable for and cannot handle. Plenty of pressure on Caitlin off the court as well. A year ago, one Indiana Fever game was nationally televised. When it became clear that Clark would be going to Indiana, it was announced 36 of 40 games this year will be nationally televised. How do you think the impact that Caitlin will have on the pro game compares with the obvious impact she already had on the college game? This is a great moment for the WNBA. He was already starting to climb as a league, and there's still so much interest in it. Over the course of the last couple of years, it's grown. I look at a team like the Las Vegas Aces, who won the WNBA last season, and they had to move to a bigger arena. Already had this plan for when the fever come to town, because that's going to be one of the hottest tickets in Vegas. What's going to be unique about Caitlin Clark entering the WNBA is it opens up different markets that haven't had an opportunity to see Caitlin Clark play in person yet. Los Angeles, Seattle, Phoenix, some of these markets that have been able to maybe watch on TV, but now they're going to have an opportunity to buy a ticket and go see her play in person. It's going to be an awesome moment, and hopefully the WNBA can continue growing and capitalize upon this. But also keep in mind, there are so many other great WNBA players right now that are currently in the league that are in a better position when it comes to understanding the game and the WNBA and how it works in a full season than Caitlin Clark is because she hasn't even had a chance to put on a WNBA uniform. That being said, going to be fascinating to see hopefully how this growth can sustain, but going into new markets is going to be a really interesting part of the piece of the puzzle. I don't care what that ticket costs, Megan, we can say from firsthand experience, it is absolutely worth it. Now, Caitlin is not the only former Big Ten player expected to go early in the first round. J.C. Sheldon, widely considered a top five pick. A lot of folks believe former Ohio State guard fits really well with Dallas at that number five selection. What's her appeal in the WNBA? J.C. Sheldon had WNBA scouts at every single Ohio State game I did in the month of February. They love her motor, her IQ, and her ability to defend. I think she's going to the Dallas Wings at number five because of her ability to shoot the three in addition to all of those things. Dallas was the worst three-point shooting team in the WNBA last season at 31% as a unit. J.C. Sheldon brings in the three-point shooting ability, nearly 40% this season. She brings in that motor defensively. We all watched her countless times score 
automatically turn around, start pressing, be so disruptive on the ball. And she also has that IQ where she can play off the ball, but also play point guard. Her versatility makes her a very unique pick and somebody that's going to be very attractive to teams at the next level. I think one of the most unique potential late first, early second round picks is Celeste Taylor because outside of Big Ten coaches and those that really follow this league, she's not a name that jumps out as a household name or somebody who is really known nationally. And yet WNBA teams are kind of salivating over her potential, describing her as a hidden gem. Why? Celeste Taylor is a hidden gem because she can defend at the highest level. Two years ago, she was the ACC Defensive Player of the Year at Duke. This past season, she was the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year at Ohio State. Her ability to understand angles, stay in front of defenders, and be disruptive on the ball makes her very unique. And when you get to the WNBA, it's very similar to when you come from high school and enter your freshman year of college. You have to be able to defend at the next level. It's what's going to keep you on the floor. Now, Celeste Taylor can come in. She's ready to at least have those pieces defensively. She may not have a huge impact offensively, but whoever drafts her isn't going to need her to have an offensive impact. She is coming in solely to defend, and she'll continue to develop that offensive game within each program. Over 10 points, over four rebounds per game. She can dish it out more than four there. Obviously, the steals are a huge part of her game as well. I love what Jazz Shelley did, not just this past season, Megan, but throughout her entire Nebraska career. I think she burst onto the scene a little bit during the postseason tournament and her play in Minneapolis because she was absolutely phenomenal. How does the Aussie project as a WNBA pro? The good news for Jazz Shelley is she was playing pro ball back when she was a teenager in Australia. So she understands the pace of play and the level of physicality that comes with playing at the next level. Jazz Shelley is an elite creator. She can take the ball, draw multiple defenders, and find the open teammate in traffic and quickly. She can also knock it down from three. Her offensive game is well equipped to translate over to the next level, especially the way she can navigate in ball screen situations. Once you get to the WNBA, there is so much ball screen offense that's happening. You need to have a smart guard who understands how to read the defense and get their teammates in positions to score. That's exactly what Josh Shelley brings to the table. Three other Big Ten players widely projected to be chosen on Monday night, including Indiana's Sarah Scali, who also spent time in the Big Ten at Minnesota. Is it just that she can knock down threes at any point from any spot, or is there more to Scali's game that is appealing to the WNBA? There are people who have lots of long careers and make a lot of money because they can knock down threes. And Sarah Scali is a three-point shooting specialist. That's going to be her greatest appeal to a team. And keep in mind, once a player gets drafted, it does not automatically mean that they have a roster spot. It means they have an opportunity to go to camp and compete to try to make the 12-woman roster at camp. Now, that being said, Sarah Scalia, with her ability to not only knock down the three, but she's added the ability to pump fake and take it on the floor as well. That's going to be huge at the next level. I'll be shocked if she doesn't get drafted, but it's going to be really difficult for her to make a team because I look at some of the defensive aspects that the pros really want at the next level. Many folks said Caitlin Clark is unbelievable because she's doing what she's doing without another pro on her roster. Kate Martin may tend to disagree, and some of the mock draft experts out there disagree as well because they believe the glue will be a late selection in Monday night's draft. How much is her appeal, Megan, based on the fact that she doesn't do anything off the charts, but she does a little bit of everything extremely well? Kate Martin is the type of player where you look at the stat sheet at the end of the game and you're like, oh, she had seven rebounds and this many assist and this many points maybe that doesn't stick out to you but she set amazing screens she dove on the floor for loose balls she took like eight charges in a game the little things that add up in the big way are really attractive to people you don't necessarily go to the pros expecting to be an elite scorer the truth of the matter is there are people there before you who have paid their dues who are more equipped to score in the WNBA at a high level. Kate Martin would be a great player for a team to come in and just do all the little things, play a couple of minutes a game her rookie year and, and do, you know, setting the screens, getting rebounds, diving on the floor for loose balls. That's how she made her money at Iowa. That's how she can make her money in the WNBA. 
it is really hard to make that money as a big. Indiana's Mackenzie Holmes leaves as the program's arguably best player ever, set all sorts of records, yet she's projected to go very late in this draft if she has chosen at all. I go back to Monica Sonano, Iowa's outstanding big, who had trouble making a roster. Megan Gustafson has been on and off roster since winning Big Ten Player of the Year. Why is it so hard for players like Mackenzie Holmes to transition that skill in college and that dominance and have similar success at the WNBA level? The WNBA has become so positionless. So post players have to be able to step out and knock down a 15-footer or a three-point shot. As a result, you see some of the back-to-back -back traditional post players in college that were so dominant not necessarily find spots on rosters in the WNBA. A lot of teams also want bigs that can come out and defend on the perimeter if need be. That's the reason why it's so difficult to get onto a roster. Mackenzie Holmes has some of the most sound footwork I have ever seen. She is so fundamental. She's dominant with her back to the basket. It's going to be interesting to see over the course of her pro career, can she develop more of a face-up game where she can knock down that 15-footer at a more consistent level, and it helps spread the floor for everybody else to have space to move on offense. Megan, I guess the great news is we get to hear all these players chosen in the WNBA draft on Monday night. But sadly and selfishly, I guess for us, it means we don't get to see them in the Big Ten next season. I know it's that I'm wearing my WNBA hat in honor of the day because it's very exciting for everybody to potentially have the opportunity to hear their name called. But I tell you what, I have to give a shout out to this senior class because they have helped put Big Ten women's basketball on the map in some ways that we didn't even know were possible. So shout out to every single senior who made an impact this season throughout the Big Ten. Well said, Megan. We truly appreciate the time. WNBA draft comes your way on Monday night. And with that, it is time for the big stat presented by Gatorade. Caitlin Clark will become the second number one pick from the Big Ten. Janelle McCarville, the first and only to be chosen with the top overall pick, former Minnesota star, went number one to Charlotte all the way back in 2005. Four players have been chosen with the number two overall selection, including most recently Diamond Miller just a year ago. And we'll head to the men's game next. Trent Meacham joins me as we assess the impact of new coaching hires and the always intriguing transfer portal. Plus, after another successful season comes up just short of the natty, what's next for Big Ten hockey? Paul Capanigri has the answer when Big Ten Today rolls on. Is it as hard to believe for you as it is for me that it was just a week ago Purdue played UConn in the national championship game? The Boilermakers, of course, back-to-back -back regular season champs got to the natty for just the second time ever, first time since 1969. They were part of a group of six teams that made the NCAA tournament. Illinois made it all the way to the Elite Eight. Nebraska was in the tournament, and because of that season and 23 wins, Fred Hoiberg was named the Jim Phelan National Coach of the Year. Back inside Big Ten today in our Big Ten Network studios, Rick Pizzo joined by Trent Meacham. Purdue's run certainly wasn't unexpected. It was impressive, as was Zach Eady winning both Big Ten and Naismith Player of the Year two years in a row. But the Boilermakers weren't the only team that had a really impressive season. Your alma mater, Illinois, making a run to the Elite Eight. Yeah, I think overall for the Big Ten, it, it was a solid year. And what you want is to have the opportunity to compete for championships, and we'll start with those two teams. Purdue and Illinois, Purdue obviously after losing to a 16 seed, the run that they went on the entire year, their year of dominance, another Big Ten title, so impressive. Zach Eadie's going to retire from his Purdue uniform as a legend in college basketball, one of the best to play in this conference in the history of Big Ten play. And I look at Illinois, and then look, a, a team that did it very differently. Matt Painter's done it through development for the most part. And, yes, Brad Underwood's done that. Coleman Hawkins developed over the course of his career at Illinois, but bringing in a lot of transfers. And Illinois kind of getting back to the top of the Big Ten, won a Big Ten tournament title in, in Minneapolis, advanced to the Elite Eight, I think was final for good, Rick. They ran it against, up against UConn and couldn't – wasn't quite that good. But, Nobody was. But those two teams, you know, you, you – you did what you wanted to do. You have the talent, you have the ability to put yourself in position to get to the Final Four to win a championship. Meanwhile, there were a couple of teams that were somewhat surprising with their level of success. Northwestern and Nebraska. Boo Booey just continued to impress. Chris Collins did maybe his best coaching job ever, and that was the year after he was named Big Ten Coach of the Year. And, of course, what Fred Hoiberg and Nebraska did with 23 wins, I know it ended in a disappointing fashion for the Huskers, not being able to get an NCAA tournament win. 
but it seems like that program has kind of turned the same corner that Northwestern maybe turned a couple of years ago. It's a great example of what makes this conference so good in basketball. Now we got four new schools coming in, but those two teams, traditionally you would not think of Nebraska or Northwestern as a top of the Big Ten team. Well, both those, they finished third and fourth in our league, and the coaching from top to bottom is so good in this league. It's so hard to win games in conference play. And so what Chris Collins did with that ball club, battling through some injuries, was maybe a more impressive job than the year before when he was Big Ten Coach of the Year. And then Fred Hoiberg, what he's established in Nebraska, their fan support, the year they had. I mean, it just shows it is tough to win in this league, and now you can't count out anybody. Not just a talented and deep coaching staff here in the Big Ten, but one that's had a lot of stability over the years. Of course, every year there's change, and that has been the case this season in the Big Ten as well. Ohio State struggled. Chris Holman was let go. Jake Diebler was the interim head coach and then had the interim tag taken off after a terrific run throughout the postseason at both the Big Ten tournament and in the NIT. And Jawan Howard departs after a disappointing tenure, certainly the last part of it at Michigan, replaced by Dusty May, who's done such great work at Florida Atlantic, has Big Ten ties, went to IU, was a student manager on Indiana teams under Bob Knight. How quickly do you think he impacts a Michigan program that the last season or season and a half was really not in a great place? Well, with the transfer portal now, you have the opportunity to <clears throat> have an immediate impact, get older, get experienced guys, get talented guys in right away, <clears throat> not have to realize as much on freshman and development. He's got a couple great players, two of the best in the country at Florida Atlantic, John L. Davis, Vlad Golden. We'll see if they follow him to Michigan. I think Dusty May's a great hire. I think he's got the youth, the energy. The, the way that they played at Florida Atlantic, a modern brand of basketball, four out, five out basketball, lets his guards go, I think is a great pickup for Michigan. If Davis and Golden do decide to go to Ann Arbor, it completely flips what the expectations would be for Michigan next year because then you have a score, you have a legit big, and you can surround them with the pieces that are already there or other recruits or transfers because everything right now is moving in the world of college basketball. I will call myself out because you and I discussed Jake Diebler's possibility of being the permanent head coach when he was given the interim tag, and I said, I don't think there's any way. Ohio State had a new AD and Ross Bjork coming in as Gene Smith retires. Most ADs want to put their own stamp on a program. I thought he'd want to go out and get a big, splashy hire. And then Diebler did what he did, the win over Purdue, the move in the Big Ten tournament, the run through the NIT. He's an Ohio guy through and through, and they decide to elevate him to the permanent head coach. Your thoughts on that decision and what's expected of him next year in Columbus? I'm a little biased. I like the Diebler family. I know John I know you Diebler do. pretty well. But, look, it's not just that he won in those six weeks or so at, at, at the helm as the, as the leader for this basketball team. I think it's how he did it. And the ADs at Ohio State, the, 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 the university got to see how he led, how he communicated, the support that he, that he how he galvanized this, the current uh, roster of team, but also alums. I know a number of former Buckeye players, and they were really pulling, rooting for Jake Diebler. Again, another guy, Rick, he's young. I think he's ready for the, this new era of, college, era of college basketball. This is a different game now, and I think he's primed to have great success at Ohio State as a head coach. Also some changes at schools that will be Big Ten institutions as of August of this coming year. USC saw Andy Enfield leave his job to take the head coach job at SMU, so that opened up the Trojan job. In steps Eric Musselman, who had a very successful run at Arkansas. He's been kind of everywhere. And then another young guy on the up and up, Danny Sprinkle, moves up a level to take the head job at Washington. This domino effect of these coaching changes is, Every year. is, is really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, Eric Musselman's a guy that's a ton of energy, has recruited well, had success, went to, to Sweet 16s at Nevada, has been to two Elite Eights at Arkansas. He's just a really good coach. Has Rick, you mentioned everywhere. Uh, G League, international, NBA. He's done it at a high, high level at the college game. I expect him to hit the ground running at USC. And then Danny Sprinkle at Washington. He's had success at his alma mater, Montana State, to the NCAA tournament. At Utah State last year, winning the game in the NCAA tournament. So guys that have had success getting to the tournament, winning games in the tournament. Again, we talk about the coaches in this league. And I think that's what makes it so good. And now you have four new teams two of those teams with new coaches, and I think they're going to do really well. Next year, I think it's just going to be so much fun when you incorporate these four new teams and is it four new coaches now as well. We talk about the transfer portal and how much it changes the way that college basketball is played. It changes the rosters. 
it also changes the coaching job trend because now these guys are not just recruiting in the traditional way. Matt Painter is a perfect example, right? Still wants to go the high school route. Other coaches have to decide if you're a guy like Dusty May or Eric Musselman and you step into a high profile job and success is expected immediately. Isn't the easiest way to do it to find a ready made guy who's already been an established player at a different institution and convince him to come to your campus? These are the most important, you know, next four to eight weeks, the most important time of the year for these coaches and their teams. And for sure, Rick, I think typically a 22-year-old who's been through the battles of college basketball, who's had success, who's gone through some adversity, who's had some success, is going to fare better than an 18-year-old. Nowadays, it's so hard as a freshman to come in and contribute to winning basketball at the highest level. We've seen it. And even some guys that maybe weren't at the top of transfer lists, list, a Lance Jones for Purdue, a Marcus Damask, a Rink Mass, some guys that come from a smaller level and then were able to elevate their games because, hey, they've done it for a number of years. They've produced at a high level. So it's hard. These coaches have to make decisions quickly on who to take and how to, 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 to bring a roster together. But it does give those new guys a great opportunity to have success, a much better opportunity, I, would, I believe, in year one. The Jones and Damask story to me is so intriguing. You're at the same school – and then you transfer. Jones goes to Purdue. They go all the way to the NCAA title game. Domas goes to Illinois. He's all Big Ten first team and takes Illinois to the Elite Eight. Coaches are out there now trying to search for that next program where the guys are being developed that same way so they can come into the Big Ten and have success in a Power Five league immediately. We'll talk transfers much more and how they could affect next season and debate decisions on college versus cash when we return. Some of the Big Ten's best mulling that question made famous by the clash. Should I stay or should I go? Transfer portal conversation time. Actually, I think over the next couple of weeks, that's all it is, is transfer talk time. When you think about Big Ten basketball, you're looking at some of the notable players committed to current and, of course, future Big Ten schools. You look at Kobe Johnson from USC to UCLA. It's not a long trip, but it's certainly a big-time difference for the Bruins. Indiana really building a very strong transfer class. You see some other familiar names on there. Michi Johnson, a once past and now future Buckeye as well, going down to South Carolina now coming back to Columbus as we welcome you back in studio with Trent Meacham. It is really hard, I know, to gauge what we think the impact of the transfers will be because you still have to meld in with other transfers. You have to meld in with the existing guys that are on the roster. But let's start with Kevin Willard and Maryland because it was a disappointing season. Coming off the previous year and a really good run in Willard's first season, this team could really never find its footing. So I'm not surprised at all to see Kevin Willard and the staff deep inside the portal. For sure, and, and they've done some work early. One, getting Julian Reese back was really big for them. Uh, that's going to be huge for them, uh, a, a pivot that they can play through. But in the transfer portal, getting a guy that can replace Jameer Young, not saying he's going to be the same type of player, but in Jacoby Gillespie from Belmont, 6'1", 6'1 guard, averaged 17 points a game. It, this is a really good player. They need someone that can come in right away and play. We talk about to rely on a freshman to do that would be so difficult, and now you got that's that's done it at a high level in a good league, I would expect him, similar to Jameer Young that came from Charlotte, hit the ground running in the Big Ten. I think Jacoby Gillespie is going to do the same thing. If you've done it before as a coaching staff at a similar position, I think you'd know how to do it again. That's the great news for Kevin Willard and the Maryland staff. As for your alma mater at Illinois, we knew we would see some changes, and we are. There are some big-time scores and some big-time role players moving on to the next level, moving on to other places. But Illinois has been very busy inside the transfer portal, and I think that's no surprise. Well, Brad Underwood has maybe been the king of the portal in the last couple of years. He's embraced it. He's done well with it. Obviously, he brought in Terrence Shannon, Matt Meyer a couple of years ago, brought in Alfonso Plummer uh, a few years ago, and this year with Damask and Gary A. Really good lineup there. Once again, he's got to replenish a roster. Uh, they got Jake Davis, a 6'6 shooter for Mercer. That's needed. Trey White, a guy that played at U U USC. Yep. And then Louisville, another good year, 6'6, six, 6'7, six, six, athletic guy. Kylan Boswell, though, a kid that I know really well. Uh, went to school with his dad. Who don't you know really well in the <laughs> college a, basketball he's world? He's a champagne, and I'll tell you what, Rick, he's a champagne kid. Maybe the best kid ever from the area coming back to play the big statement. on that orange and blue jersey, former five-star guy, a lot of potential for him. So, Illinois, they're going to look so different next year. But, 
You know, Brad Underwood is off to a hot start in the, in the transfer portal. It's not slowing down. You know, there's some rumors, too. Possibly A.J. Storr. We'll see how this all plays out. Uh, from Champagne to Italy, France, I want to go to Belgium. Meacham <laughs> knows somebody everywhere playing basketball. I mentioned Indiana and Mike Woodson because they are going hard into the portal. Khalil Ware declares he's not coming back. We knew that was going to be the case. And there are some other decisions that current players have to make. But I think Woodson, who, who made it clear at the end of the year, I'm not going anywhere. They're not firing me. I'm doing a good job here. And I, and I love that confidence. Indiana played well late in the year, but they clearly need some pieces. Yes, they do. Well, Trey Galloway mentioned he's coming back. You got McKenzie and Baco, Malik Renew. I just mentioned those guys coming back. They are going to be a force on the inside. There's rumors of Umar Balo, well, maybe the top transfer guy in the transfer portal, seven-foot center from Arizona, really good player. But a key pickup for them, they got a guy, Miles Rice, was a Pac-12 newcomer of the year last year at Washington State, can really score the ball, had 35 against Stanford, a smooth, skilled player. They need elite guard play. Their front line is going to be a monster, especially if Balo comes in the fold. There's some other guys they have on, the, on campus soon. Uh, Indiana is setting themselves up to maybe be one of the top teams in the league next year. It's because of who they brought back, this transfer portal. They got a guard in Miles Rice. I think they could still add some shooting that could be needed. But Mike Woodson, I think he's seen, you know, after last year having a great front court, he needs some guard play, and they're getting it. A yeah, five-star recruit, but they do need shooting. That was, I yes. think, the biggest issue last year. They had post play. I mean, if Balo comes in and then you have Balo and Renew. That's going to be a pretty nice one. Two punch, very different guys that like to play in the post. USC, UCLA also into the portal. What do you expect from these teams in year one? They're transitioning into a new league. They have great tradition. They've had recent success. They've had really good players. But obviously, like everybody else, they're looking at ready-made players in the portal, too. Yeah, USC, I, I would not – I think Eric Musselman is just such a good coach and just ferocious on the recruiting trail. I think he's going to do well. They already got a couple guys in the portal, guys that have produced at a high level, experienced guys. Clark Slatchert from Penn, 6'1 guard, can really shoot the ball, really shoot the ball. Josh Cohen, a guy that averaged over 22 a game at St. Francis, went to UMass, averaged about 16-7. and seven. So they got a couple guys – that are experienced, that I think they can kind of build around. I say build around, Rick, maybe in year one. Um, I would expect USC, especially with, with, with Musselman, to do very well. Mick Cronin has had success at a couple different stops. They got a guy that's played in the Big Ten, Sky Clark, former Illinois guy, had a, had a pretty good numbers year at Louisville this last year. Last game of the season at 36 against NC State, a skilled player, former five-star recruit. You mentioned earlier Kobe Johnson going across town from USC to UCLA. So, again, there's, there's just – this is so early in the process. It's so intriguing how these coaches are going to form their rosters. And it's going to be really fun to follow over the, ne the course of the next couple months. Yeah, to me, this is exactly what the transfer portal is. From UMass to St. Francis to the West Coast, from Illinois to Louisville to the West Coast, you just never know where you're going to get your next guy. As I mentioned, one thing we do know – Indiana won't have Khalil Ware because he is among the group that has declared for the NBA draft. Now, every other player on this list has decided they want to maintain their eligibility, which means as long as they make the decision before the NBA draft deadline, they have the option of returning to college. I don't think the Ware decision was at all surprising. He improved his stock, I think, dramatically this past season. Now he just needs to become, I think, in the positionless NBA, a more consistent three-point shooter. But he's a guy who can certainly do it. Yeah, there's still – he's got so much more room to grow. Despite his number, 16 and 10 last year, about two blocks a game, shot at a high percentage from the three-point line, even over 40%. Yeah. Now, just took one a game. But he's, he, he's a modern-day big, can space the floor, can finish around the basket. I think his defense, his shot blocking, his rebounding will only improve. This is a guy that is a freshman at Oregon. Really, there was a lot of knocks on him. Does he have the motor? Does he have the toughness? I think he answered a lot of, the, a lot of those calls last year. Give Mike Woodson, his staff, a lot of credit for developing him. He is just getting going as a basketball player. I think he's going to be a really good NBA player. I know you really like Peyton Sanford's game, and he was terrific, not just in terms of production this past season, but he really took on the role as the leader of this Iowa team. Needs to put on some muscle and get a little bit stronger to go into the NBA. What do you think of his pro prospects and whether he needs another year in college? Well, I like Sanford because of his size at six foot seven. He rebounds the ball, almost seven rebounds a game, but his shooting is, is really the separator. It's elite. And, you know, almost 38% from, from the three, took over seven a game. So he's a high-volume shooter. 
I liken him and how he shoots to Clay Thompson. It's a really simple, quick release. He doesn't need to bring that ball down. He can keep it high and get that shot off quick. He's great moving without the ball, so he does, he's a guy that doesn't need the ball in his hands. Defensive, his defensive ability will be the question mark, but he is a competitor, and, and he's a great leader. I think he has all the intangibles. You combine that with shooting, whether it's this year or next year, I think he will find himself in the NBA. I don't think any player in college basketball gets the ball out of their hand more quickly and combines it with a more accurate shot than Peyton Sanford. Now, something of a similar guy, not nearly as good a shooter, but good size, ability to rebound and score, Brooks Barnheiser. He was a little up and down this year, sometimes disappeared in moments for Northwestern, but when he was on, he showed that I think he does have the ability to play at the next level. I'm not sure as a starter, as a big-time production guy, but he could certainly be a bench player or a role player in the NBA. Well, I love Brooks Barnheiser because he's tough, he's smart, he's skilled. You know, I, I think the biggest thing for him will be his shooting. When I look at his numbers, only 18% as a freshman, not a high volume there. Went to 31% as a sophomore, almost 35% last year, over three attempts a game. So he's getting up a decent rate of those. He's knocking them down at a higher rate. I think if he's close to 40%, he, he's definitely he, he's an NBA player. He's got to improve as a shooter, though, but he's a competitor. He can beat you in so many different ways. And I think at some point, he'll find himself on an NBA floor. Yeah, great numbers and part of that Northwestern team. The first roster ever that can say they made the NCAA tournament in back-to-back -back seasons. Great stuff, as always, from Trent Meacham. But when we come back, it is time for pucks on the flip side. Another Frozen Four, another year without the natty. Paul Capanigri on the immediate future of the league's ice capades when we return. It is time for this edition of Around the Big Ten. Did you know that Bill Belichick, big Northwestern women's lacrosse fan, he was there for the game against Ohio State, goes all the way back to 2008. Kelly Amante Hiller and the Cats were two-time defending national champs. She needed a perspective from someone whose teams had been there, what that pressure was like. She reached out to the Patriots. Belichick himself got back to her. She said th she thought it was a joke that somebody was pranking her. It was, in fact, the legendary coach They've been friends ever since. Meanwhile, the softball team doing good work as always. Johan Sisters once again leading the Big Ten's best Northwestern with a weekend sweep over Maryland. Cats have now won seven in a row. They sit atop the Big Ten standings. They are 12-1 and one in line for yet another regular season championship and a spot in the NCAA tournament. And the Illini baseball team is doing some serious yard work. Jacob Schroeder, Drake Westcott, each hitting three bombs in the win over Northern Illinois. First-time Illinois teammates have hit three home runs since at least 2004, and we say at least because that's as far back as those official stats go, so it could be an even longer stretch than that. Speaking of long stretches, 2007, now the last time the Big Ten won a national championship. Of course, Michigan State wasn't officially a Big Ten hockey school back then, but they were a Big Ten institution. Since then, the league has been to the Frozen Four, but they can't quite get over that hump. Minnesota lost in overtime in the title game a year ago. Michigan this season made its third consecutive appearance in the Frozen Four, but for the third straight year, the Wolverines lose in the national semifinals 4-0 to Boston College. We were there to watch it we in were. person. Rick Pizzo, Paul Caponigri. Listen, it's still a great season yeah. for Michigan, but everybody's wondering and waiting for that next national championship. I mentioned yeah. none for the Big Ten since 07, yeah. none for Michigan since 98. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it last week. It's With Michigan, too, they were like the fourth team in the Big Ten this year. And, but they, they found a way, and I, and I think that's something you have to take a, give them a lot of credit for. They find a way to get there. Now it's just obviously getting over that big hump. And when you're in the Frozen Four, you're playing obviously against elite the talent. Best. Right. So, you know, what do you, what do you, you know, it's like kind of, oh, you know, so many positives, but but. There's yes. a but at the end. And like you said, there's only one team win. And look, the number one team that was on a 15-game winning streak, they didn't win it. Boston College got upset. You call it an upset. Denver was a number one seed, too. But that was an upset. So it is so difficult to win. So with Michigan and then with the Big Ten. But I just love the way the, the Big Ten is trending. Yes. You keep putting teams in. You keep winning games, getting to those elite spots. You're going to find a way. And let's give credit to Brandon Narado. Remember, it was just over a year ago, right before the 2023 Frozen Four, right. 
that he was named the permanent head coach after having taken over yeah. earlier in the year after Mel Pearson's dismissal. He basically spent the whole season as the interim. They get into the Frozen. They make it back this year. I understand they've lost against two really good teams sure. in the national semifinals and in a game in 2022 in the Frozen Four as well. But pretty much every other program in the nation, save those who won the national title, would trade places with the Wolverines. Well, they're, he's the only, they're the only team that's done it for three years in a row. Um, and for Brandon to do that, a young coach, his coaching staff is young. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, maybe you want to bring in a veteran guy sometimes. But the, the relationships with the kids right now is so important. And I think they've locked that in. A, a former team of mine, Matt Deschamps, has come in and he's really done well with the defense. For, you know, Fred Pletch talked about that last week. He's a week. genius, they call him. Yeah, I mean, hey, that's great. And you put the genius with the talent you bring in, and you saw that. That was where Michigan was able to get to the pros, where their defense, all the offense they talked about, their defense was what really solidified them late in that year. You saw other guys come up when, when Seamus Casey got hurt. So a lot of good things for Michigan to build off of it. Like you said, it's only Brandon Rottles. It's going to be his second full year yes. as the guy. He's building his recruits, all that kind of stuff. So good things ahead for Michigan. Of course, the Wolverines got to the Frozen Four because they won a regional final against their in-state rivals from East Lansing. Michigan State had beaten Michigan four of five previous meetings during the year, but the Wolverines won in the one game yeah. with the Frozen Four on the line. Still, what a year it was for Adam Nightingale and the Spartans. And you start to think about the future. They have a renovated Munn. They have an unbelievable roster. Recruiting right now for Nightingale and the staff is off the charts. Yep. And now kids want to transfer from other top-end schools <laughs> to play in East right. Lansing. I think he has this program here to stay. Without a, without a doubt. I think the, the big thing now is like you almost maybe have – you might have a problem of too many. And right now, this is the last year with the fifth year, right, the COVID year. You might want a guy like their captain, Nash Niehaus, might want to come back. And so then maybe you hold off a guy. But what they're doing right now is, yes, you're, you've become like now the wanted program. You're a destination. Opposed, right. Before you had to like, not to say beg, but you had to over-recruit to get players. Now you have your facilities are set. You saw the, the place for the Big Ten tournament championship game was just bananas. Like, if you're a recruit and you were at that game, why would you not want to go there? So they have everything working for him, and I love Adam Nightingale's demeanor. He's never high, too high, too low. He's right in the middle, and he relates really well to the kids, and I think that helps too. So all good things in Michigan State right now. Two other teams making it to the NCAA tournament, yep. of course, Minnesota and Wisconsin as well. And I, and I know those teams didn't get to the Frozen and they had some yeah. high expectations, but the expectations are always going to be there in the Twin Cities <laughs> yes. when you play for pride on ice. I mean, that is what the Gophers are all about. And Wisconsin, remember, I, I know Mike Hastings has been there, done that, but this was year one for him in Madison. Yeah. So there's plenty to build on there as well. Well, and especially from where they came last year, they were at the bottom of the league. Um, I think, and we talked about this before, he, he, he took them, I think, the expectations were in the middle, I think. I had them about fourth or fifth in the league beforehand. He got them up to the top, but then I think they regressed to where about they should have been. You know, they're a top 10-ish team, not a top five when it came down to it, and you kind of saw how it ended. But it was a great building block for them. It, it, very similar to what Adam Nightingale did two years ago. I think Wisconsin had a little more talent this year, and then obviously Kyle McClellan, who wins the Mike Richter Award, was an obviously huge boost in net. Um, but I, it's very similar to what Mich uh, Michigan State is doing. Mi Wisconsin is – it wasn't a flash in the pan. This is a building block, and they're going to be coming. And so now you have four teams right now right there that are right at the top, and it's going to put pressure on Ohio State, Notre Dame, and Penn State recruiting-wise and to get back up there because when you have a 17-team league, you've got to play those teams all the time, and it's going to be really hard to kind of – you know, get over 500. And it's Notre Dame's had that trouble, right? They're right at that 500 level, but that doesn't get you into the tournament most times. And we shall see what happens next year with all this roster turnover because <laughs> we saw Cutter Gauthier, the nation's leading goal scorer, signing with Anaheim earlier yep. in the week. There is some top level talent that yes. could potentially leave college hockey right now that would completely change the landscape, not just in the Big Ten, but in Hockey East, NCHC, and the other leagues that have dominated college yes. hockey over the last couple of years. Speaking of that, we'll take one final break. Have we seen the final games in college for the likes of Brindley and Artie as they dream of copying Frankie's first? The answer, and yes, we'll explain what I'm talking about coming up next.
you know, there's no time to waste when your season comes to a close in college hockey. You got to decide. Are you coming back? Are you transferring? Or are you going to sign with the team that drafted you? Here you see some decisions already made. We'll introduce you to Frank Nazar's debut at the Blackhawks in just a second. But you see some other big-time names, including some who have decided to return to school. I was a bit surprised to see Jimmy Snuggerud back to Minneapolis. Trey Augustine had a phenomenal freshman year for the Spartans. He's coming back. Charlie Stramble is coming back. But he's not going to Madison. He's returning to school and transferring to Michigan State, as we discussed. Spartans now a destination Wild, program. wild west. <laughs> Here we go with Frankie Nazar's debut. Signs with the Blackhawks. Get put in the lineup. And on his very first shot, Cappy, this is what dreams are made of. I mean, this is awesome. And you know what? It's something that the Chicago Blackhawks fans need desperately. Yeah. Uh, last home game of the year, a little hope. You know, yes, they have Connor Bedard, but another young player uh, showing a little, you know, yes. showmanship early on. They needed something like that. So good for him and good for their well, well, Frankie joined us when we were yeah. in St. Paul, came up to our set location. The beard is gone now. We had a great chat. <laughs> yeah, the playoff beard has been, has been shaved yep. off. When you look at his makeup, his skill yep. set, his size, where he fits with a team that you know very well in sure. the Blackhawks, what do you think that role will be? Yeah, I mean, he places right now right behind Connor Bedard as like their second line center. And they like they have a lot of root. They have veteran guys, but nobody that they deem as their future. So I think he's going to get all the opportunity. Uh, he's going to play in their last two games this year. And then we'll see next year, obviously spend the summer, have a good offseason. But I think they'll go in with it's his spot to lose come next year as a he's going to be a 20 year old rookie in the NHL and yeah he had a great first game but I think for those guys it starts coming when you're playing an 82 full game schedule you know the the glitz and glamour of your first time coming isn't there but I think he's a guy he's got all the talent his vision on the ice his speed even some of his his uh, teammates yesterday new teammates were like wow this guy's fast you bring speed you push put teams on their uh, their heels that those are all positive things that he brings. And you start to look at how deep and talented this Michigan roster is. We got word just on Monday morning that Tyler Duke signed yep. with the Lightning. Obviously, the Lightning don't really need any help right now. Right. So he'll probably start in Syracuse, maybe Syracuse, yep. AHL, and, and then his contract go will from start there. the next year. Correct. That's the difference between him and Frank. Frank wanted his his contract to start now, so his three year deal essentially is a two year deal after this. Okay. For Dylan's will start the start of next season. Understand. It's a little understand. different. And it changes yeah. the way that the salary caps work and all totally. the leverage hits. And when the they teams. get their next contract, right. you know, they're trying to work it their best way. Sure. Okay. Well, and they're a playoff team. The Blackhawks clearly are not a playoff team. Right. So they're not as – they're in more hurry – with Duke, they're not as much hurry to get him up to the NHL. So, another Michigan guy, Gavin Brindley, highly yeah. sought-after guy. Listen, Rutger McGordy's out there as well. We understand his decision is coming yep. very soon. What do you think of Brindley? I mean, he's to me, he's a really fascinating prospect because of his ability to do, especially offensively, what he does. But yep. what would an NHL team want if he were to decide to go back to school? What would the Blue Jackets yeah. want to see? I mean, for me, I, he's 19 until October, which means if he came back and played another year, this time next year, he'd be t still 20, halfway yeah. to 21 still only. He's not a huge guy. He's got room to fill out his body. He's an energetic player. He plays a physical game for how small he is. I just think, look, I'm never going to tell a guy not to go pro. I just think another year wouldn't hurt. Columbus Blue Jackets, he's a second-round pick, which I, no, I think he's going to never up, hurts. No, it doesn't. And obviously, it's family decisions, all that. There's a lot of different things that go into it. I just think, well, selfishly, I'd love to see him play another year in the Big Ten. Um, also, Seamus Casey is one of his best friends, and I feel like those two guys are almost like, do we come back? Let's let's play again, because Michigan would be really good if those two came back. They look at a national title. So those decisions, it's it's family, it's coaches, it's you know his family representatives, all that kind of stuff. But he's not going to make a bad decision. He's going to be successful either way. Did I say Tyler Duke? By the way, Dylan, Dylan Duke, Duke signing with his Tampa brother Bay, will be back course. next year. Yes, he will Tyler. be back next year. Uh, lastly, Artem Levshinov yes. finished. First year with Michigan State, he is widely – so he hasn't been drafted yet, right, because he right. wasn't eligible. This but is the, the great thing about college He's projected hockey. to be top three this yep. year. 
So then there's a decision. You're top three. Right. You're in that upper echelon of <laughs> contracts where you can sign a legitimate money sure. and financial deal. But clearly, at his age, there's development to be had. Of course. And it, and it depends on what team takes them. I also think defense take a longer time to develop. And I, for me, I think the smartest thing for him to do would be to come back. But it's if he goes, say it's the Chicago Blackhawks, a team that needs a lot of young talent. But they also might say, we're not in a hurry to bring you in because we're not looking to make the playoffs next year. Right. It's, it's, it's a tricky one. I think he should come back and play another year. But, I mean, he was a first team all league. He was a freshman of the year. He was an all-American second team. He's done a lot of things, but he can build off of that. And he looked like he enjoyed his hey, college experience, which is important to come back. He spent a couple extra years. Maybe you turn into and Brock Faber. Nightingale. Play too. 25 minutes your rookie, rookie year. year. Run yeah. the power play. Rookie of the year contention with Connor Bedard. Yep. Decisions, decisions, decisions. For no Trent bad ones. Paul, I'm Rick. Thanks for hanging with us on Big Ten Today.